Well, it's exactly um, top of the hour. So um, I'd like to welcome you uh, all to our webinar. My name is Brad Staples. I'm the uh, CEO of APCO uh, Worldwide, and I'm delighted to have the uh, honor of uh, hosting this uh, session and uh, helping uh, keep us to, uh, to plan in terms of our conversation today. We have uh, three fascinating speakers, exceptionally well-placed to talk about the topic at hand, which is protecting individual rights as our economic and social orders are restored. Uh, the plan um, will be to uh, listen to our panelists uh, and their opening remarks for about 20 minutes or so in total. And then we'll uh, open up uh, the, uh, the discussion for important uh, questions from, um, from, from the audience. Um, you'll see the chat function at the base of the uh, screen. You're welcome to uh, put any questions that you have into the chat function or into the, uh, the Q&A function as well. There's also a hand raising uh, uh, option as well. So plenty of ways to ask questions. Um, just uh, a few house rules. Uh, this is on the record, which means that we're recording uh, and the comments are attributed uh, we may have one or two uh, members of the press uh, with us. We certainly have folks from the tech community, from the corporate world, from civil society and NGOs, academics and, and, and others who are, who are joining us. And we're very happy to have a, a, a very varied um, audience for the session. It will take us about an hour or so to get through everything. And, um, and thank you again, everybody, for, for joining us to, today. Um, well, we're here to talk about a topic that is um, front and center of so many conversations at the moment. The timing couldn't be better. And after months of, of, of lockdown, we're starting to see uh, several countries are, across the globe beginning to take the first steps to, to, to reopening their economies and, and their societies. These are tentative steps, but there's clearly um, a journey that we're on that is very different to the place that we were in uh, just uh, just three months or so ago. Nevertheless, COVID-19 is still with us. Um, it hasn't got away. Uh, it's something we, we need to adapt to. Uh, it's had profound implications on the way we all organize our lives, how we work, how we travel, how we uh, educate, how we do business, uh, how we consume, and it's shaping how we plan for the future, both for this year and and, and beyond one anticipates. Um, clearly every aspect of public policy is being shaped by this moment and by the spread of the virus. And, and nowhere is that more clear and more relevant than at the nexus of um, healthcare and, and technology. Uh, there is a very lively global conversation take, taking place about how we use um, technology to enable society to emerge from this situation. And at the same time, there is a vigorous discussion about how we uh, respect privacy rights and, and secure the volumes of data that will be needed to have an effective uh, mechanism for tracking and tracing and digitally certifying um, uh, uh, those affected uh, by, by the virus. Um, this comes at a moment when there are still many unresolved issues related to our data sharing, uh, the uh, storage of data, and they are obviously now at the center of this conversation. So um, we'll need consent, we'll need buy-in of the public if we're to move forward, um, uh, or we're going to look at more prescriptive models. Uh, certainly in some parts of the world, that may be choices that are being, that are being taken. Um, we're dealing with issues of trust, trust the risks that emerge from such a crisis. Um, if we move too quickly, what the implications of that might be. Um, so we're, we're in a moment where surveillance, tracking and trust in corporates and, and governments is very much front of mind, very central to every conversation. Um, and we could not have three better speakers to guide us through some of these issues and challenges. We're going to hear today from Laura Gardner, who is the uh, Director of Global Privacy Policy at Microsoft, um, from Dakota Gruner, who is from ID2020, 
and from Bila Star from the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. So three uh, superbly well-placed um, panelists. I'm going to turn to, to, to Laura uh, first to, to, to say a, a few things uh, from her vantage point. Laura is Director of Global Privacy Policy, as I've mentioned. She provides counsel and advocacy on a range of privacy and data protection issues across the globe. She works uh, across Microsoft to coordinate the outward facing positions that the company takes. And she provides input on global legislation and, and regulation. Previously, she was with Warner uh, Media and prior to that, an attorney, an attorney, excuse me, with the US Department of, uh, of Commerce. So exceptionally well placed. Um, Laura, can I, can I ask you, um, uh, Microsoft's elaborated seven privacy principles for governments, public health authorities, academics, employers. Um, can you help us understand how those principles might guide the direction that uh, global decision makers are going to take uh, on these questions? Sure. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for putting this together. I think this is really a, an interesting topic and a great panel that you've assembled to talk through some of these issues. Um, so, you know, Microsoft has been focused on this for quite a while, right? We're based in Seattle, so that's really the epicenter of the epidemic and um, of the pandemic, really. And uh, so we've been thinking about this from the start and have been thinking about how to support many of our customers and partners. Um, we realize that tech solutions need to be used in order to deal with a lot of the different aspects of the pandemic. Um, but it's really important to make sure that those solutions are, are trusted by, by their users. And so you have to develop them with privacy and ethics in mind. So I think there's been a lot of conversation around um, tracking, tracing and testing, TTT is what we've called it. Um, and we published a blog post where we just set out some of the principles that we think should be considered when tools for those um, TTT solutions are being developed, the tracking, tracing and testing apps. Um, and the idea was that, you know, we, don't plan to develop these ourselves, but we work so closely and provide solutions and um, technological support for a variety of um, different companies and organizations that do intend to develop these sorts of apps. So we wanted to provide a little bit of guidance of how we were thinking about it, because we do think a lot about how privacy can be um, integrated into technology solutions. So the privacy principles that we set out, um, there are seven. Um, the first is one that you alluded to, which is around obtaining meaningful consent. The idea that if individuals are going to use these applications and really trust them, they need to um, consent to that in order to, to really feel that they've agreed to the use of their data in this particular way. And also that that consent needs to be meaningful, that there's enough transparency around what data is being collected, how it's being used, how long it's being kept, all of that information is immediately available to the users. Another one of the principles is that the data should really only be used for the public health purposes. Um, our thought is that, you know, there, there should be a limited purpose here that the data is not going to then be used for advertising or targeting or government surveillance or, or really anything beyond the immediate public health purpose and, and that it's also important to consult with public health authorities to understand what that means, what that looks like. You know, I think a lot of tech companies are interested in helping to provide a solution and, and uh, you know, we move fast and break things, right? That's sort of the tech motto, but if we don't understand what the health, pur health purpose is, then we can't, um, you know, really effectively achieve that and, and do it in a limited way. Uh, a third purpose is to just collect the minimal amount of data. So only the data that is really needed for that public health purpose, nothing beyond that. Um, to provide users choice is the fourth principle. So um, one of those choices specifically is whether the data is stored on a user's device or on the cloud. There's, um, there are a lot of privacy benefits associated with storing the um, data on the user's device in terms of their control over that. Um, but there are also some privacy protective measures that can be put in place if it is stored in the cloud. Uh, a fifth principle is to implement appropriate safeguards. This is really sensitive data, so we want to make sure that there are security measures that are in place that will really um, make sure that that data is, is held appropriately. Um, encryption can be helpful here, differential privacy, some of the other privacy protective measures that we think about. Um, 
The sixth principle is not to share that data or health status without any consent um, and to minimize the data that's shared. There may be times when it is appropriate for that data to be shared beyond the initial application use, um, such as sharing it with a public health authority really is, is sort of what we have in mind, but um, that should be clear to the user and it should only be the data that is needed for that secondary purpose. Um, and then finally, the, the last principle is to delete the data as soon as it's not needed for the pandemic. Um, you know, that, that sort of goes along with the data minimization principle. We really just want the data to be used specifically for what users understand it will be used for, um, for purposes that public health authorities have consulted on um, and to only be used for those purposes and, and to not be available anymore once those purposes are no longer relevant. Thanks, Laura. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dakota um, to the conversation. Um, Dakota brings a, a, a different perspective as the Executive Director of ID2020. Uh, it's a public-private partnership that looks to ensure that everyone across the planet have, has access to uh, a digital uh, identity. So um, you're coming at this um, very much from the, uh, the, the perspective of the the data subject um, to Dakota, which is tr tr truly interesting. And um, it'd be great to get your, your perspective and, and perhaps one or two remarks on the, uh, the principles that uh, Laura's just mentioned. Absolutely, and thank you, Brad. Um, thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, like you said, ID2020, we're a global public-private partnership focused on digital identity and very specifically on the ethics of digital ID, um, ensuring that digital ID that is adopted is user managed, it's privacy protecting, and it's portable. Um, and so, so many of the principles that Laura just enumerated are exactly what we think about every day and what we've been um, working to, you know, to, to see in the world. Um, we bring together governments, the private sector, civil society to set, to set standards and to build trust. Um, because what we understand is that there's not, you know, huge possible potential for digital ID and also huge potential risk. Um, and so I think that that's something that you know, clearly is directly applicable to the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, you know, digital ID and now many of these solutions that we've been thinking about for tracking and testing and, and tracing um, are becoming really vital pieces of the digital infrastructure. Um, you know, to some extent, they may govern um, what rights and services we can access, what is out of reach. Um, and, you know, we recognize that they are, um, you know, while they, while they have this tremendous potential, um, you know, the design of this technology um, and then how those, you know, how those technology solutions are implemented, um, you know, could, could set us in two very different directions. Um, you know, one direction where privacy is protected, um, where individuals do manage and control their own data, um, where that information is portable, um, or alternatively, um, you know, a world in which our data is very much not our own, um, you know, privacy and security are not um, prioritized. And so we really think about this from a, a rights-based perspective. Um, I think when you talk about us thinking about it from the perspective of the data subject, um, you know, we really do think about that. It's sort of saying if we go back to the, you know, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, um, you know, Article 6 is that, um, Everyone uh, has uh, the right to recognition before the law. Um, you know, we think about that in the context of what it means for um, you know, everybody having the ability to prove who they are. And, and I think everything we do um, stems from that, that perspective. Um, you know, as you've mentioned, in the context of COVID-19, so much of our lives have been pushed online and, and so rapidly. And where we've been particularly focused has been around the discussion of immunity passports or immunity certificates, um, which you know, I think many people are considering as a means to facilitate a return to work and a return to sort of other public activities. Um, and you know, what, what we believe is vital is that it's possible to equip people to prove who they are, to prove you know, their COVID status um, and do so in a privacy protecting way. Um, so without kind of enumerating each of the principles, um, Suffice to say that I think you know all seven of the principles that um, that Laura outlined are ones that we've um, we've thought a lot about. Um, ensuring that your you know, your data is private, um, that an individual has the sole ability to share what they'd like to share, and very granularly 
um, with the organizations that they believe should have this information, um, you know, that it is um, uh, private and portable, et cetera. Um, and one thing we've done is, is develop a certification mark. Um, and this is something we actually did before COVID. Um, but what we recognized was that you know, these principles needed to be practically useful. Um, we wanted to ensure that they, um, you know, sort of had a life beyond us articulating them on a page. Um, and so the idea is that the certification incentivizes technology companies to develop um, ethical and inclusive digital ID solutions. Um, and, you know, in this case, we're actually developing a sort of fit for purpose model of the certification um, so that, you know, those identifying, or those are developing, excuse me, um, uh, credentialing solutions for the context of COVID have a way of demonstrating that they adhere to the best practices around privacy, portability, et cetera. And on the flip side, that provides health authorities, governments, and businesses who are implementing some of these programs sort of an easy shorthand to identify the solutions that adhere uh, to their values. Great, thank you, Dakota. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted just to um, close with the opening remarks from, from Vilas. Uh, Vilas Dar uh, is a trustee of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, uh, which is a major philanthropic uh, endowment focused on advancing neuroscience and technology for good. He advises on public and private sector organizations on business and philanthropic um, strategies uh, focused on the application of technology and policy to bring about transformational change. Uh, he also uh, served as the Gleitzman Fellow on Social Change at Harvard University and had a real hardship posting as the uh, practitioner resident on artificial intelligence at the Rockefeller Foundation's Bellagio Center in Lake Como. Um, we're delighted to have uh, Vilas with us. Uh, perhaps, Vilas, you could help us see what the role of philanthropy and civil society organizations can play in the context of this very decisive uh, moment of, of change for us. Thank you very much, Brad, and thank you for everyone who's joining us today. Um, I think the question you asked is spot on. Foundations and philanthropy have played this role as protectors and defenders of the public trust for essentially their entire existence. These questions of privacy, of engagement with technological solutions that lead to really a different way that you're viewed, both by society and law, are fundamental to questions of public trust. So as we have entities that are coming forward and recommending either standards or regulations, and we have entities that are coming forward and really developing the technological solutions that will allow us to implement responses to COVID-19. The civil sector has to take a step back and ask questions around where are the fundamental rights and values of our society? How are they being respected and infringed by different kinds of policy responses? So I think foundations and civil society and taken together are really coming together to ask some pretty significant questions, not just about the implementation of policies like credentialing, but a broader and more holistic view that asks questions about access and equity. Even when we have a solution that might allow somebody to demonstrate to society or to employers or to health officials that they have some type of immunity, where are the places where people actually don't even have access to the testing that would let them qualify for those credentials? What is it that we need to do in terms of building an ecosystem of support to ensure that vulnerable populations have the same access to all of the different parts of the stack as those who might be closest to it? There's a second part here, which is to think about accountability and use. And I know that both Laura and Dakota touched on this, but we are in a situation where, and I often think of the COVID-19 in a way where we're hearing kind of the tsunami warnings blaring, but the wave's not yet in sight, and we're all scrambling to respond. So as we think about technology solutions for COVID, we know that there's been a significant line of work around questions of things like digital identification. The folks on this call have really been instrumental in it. But often they've been, how do we develop pilots and how do we go out and test? We're now in a world where we have to deploy and deploy so quickly that many of the social measures that we might otherwise rely on to step in and say, wait a minute, we should think about vulnerable populations or different access and equity rights. Now we don't have the time to do. So who is it that the holders of these systems that are creating them are accountable to? And how do we ensure that they're accountable both to policymakers but to the people at large? And the final question that I think about is, the use of this data. And I know we've touched on several policy recommendations already in the conversation about limited use or making sure that credentialing is only really used in order to further sort of goals around COVID-19. 
But I think we need to take a step back and look at the broader conversation. What are the possibilities and opportunities that happen when by dint of circumstance, we are now thrust into this situation where we are going to gather this kind of information? And where is the philanthropic or civil society voice that comes in and says, well, if we're going to do this, how do we think of data, not just as a private asset, but also potentially as a public good? And if we're going to step down that path, what are the kinds of rules, regulations, and restrictions we need to put in place to make sure that that data is used well and used for the right purposes? I think there's a real space for institutions to step in here. And I started this note by talking about public trust at a time when public trust in institutions is so low, the civil sector has to step up. And by virtue of the fact that it is motivated and accountable to the public, step into that conversation and say, we will also take a point of view here. Thank you, Vilas. There'll be three uh, diff different perspectives, but um, some clear areas of, uh, of, of alignment. Um, I'm going to, if I can, just take the uh, opportunity that, um, you know, I have as moderator just to raise the first question, and um, it's, it's for Laura. Laura, these principles are thoughtfully uh, prepared and clearly uh, uh, echo some of the uh, sentiments we hear in terms of public debate right now. How have the principles that you've uh, conceived been received by po policymakers uh, around the world as you start to, to, to talk about these? We've actually seen a lot of pickup of these principles. Um, we, along with these principles, we really are advocating and we, we feel strongly that this uh, pandemic has only highlighted the need for, for stronger privacy laws in the US. I think we've seen privacy laws across the world, but um, in light of this pandemic and people's need to respond quickly, we see that there, there isn't really a strong framework of comprehensive privacy law in the US that would help guide businesses as they're trying to make decisions on how to develop these sorts of um, applications. Um, in the EU, you have something, a, a privacy impact assessment that one might undertake if they were to develop such an application where they would look at the potential risks and harms and um, also the benefits and, and weigh all of that. And there's just a framework that can provide some guidance in terms of what the development of an app like this looks like. We just don't have that in the US yet um, as a legal requirement. So that is something that we're advocating for. But um, I think in the shorter term, we've also seen that uh, lawmakers um, have been looking at these principles as they've thought about developing COVID specific privacy legislation. I think in the longer term, there is a recognition increasingly that there is a need for that comprehensive federal privacy law. Um, but in the shorter term, we've seen um, both Democratic and Republican proposals uh, for COVID specific legislation that does include some of these principles, including a requirement for consent, um, the requirement that companies uh, do uh, abide by the principles of data minimization, that they do have deletion requirements around that data, things like that. So um, that's been great to see. We really do think that these principles uh, have legs. So, uh, you know, they're, they're translatable into some sort of legislation. So we hope that that continues to move forward. Great. Thank, thanks, Laura. Um, Dakota, you, you took this to another level, in fact, and, and beyond the framework of privacy laws and talked a little bit about um, a rights-based approach and, and enshrining these rights uh, in, a, in, in, a, in, in a broader context, I think, as, as, as well. Can you talk a bit more about that and how much receptivity there is to these notions of sort of fundamental rights being protected in a different com conversation in, in, in this context? Sure. Sure, so I think probably two, there's sort of been two threads to our work um, around enshrining, enshrining these rights and enshrining these principles. I mean, the first, um, we published a white paper with Harvard Software Center for Ethics um, just about a month ago um, around immunity passports or immunity certificates. Um, and like I said, you know, this is an idea that we see having tremendous amounts of currency um, in many settings. You know, we know that the UK is moving quickly towards um, implementing such a program there are live conversations um, you know, in many US states and uh, as well as Canadian provinces and many other um, settings. Um, one very quick thing that I think important to note, um, you know, this idea of immunity passports, we think is just a sort of imprecise term. Um, you know, at this point, the science of immunity is not proven. Um, and so you know, in many of these contexts, what we think is actually meaningful to discuss is really sort of digital health certificates, um, which would be inclusive of a 
recent negative test status, um, you know, proof of vaccination once a COVID-19 vaccine becomes available, um, and you know, proof of immunity sort of only if immunity is, is scientifically um, proven. And you know, there have been a lot of very reasonable criticisms of the sort of immunity passport um, programs. Um, that I think should make us very skeptical, very cautious of such of these programs. And I think actually what's quite nice is that this has really galvanized a conversation around some of the broader expectations we should have of you know, technology-assisted programs. Um, so the safeguards that you know, I think people are now discussing putting in place around you know, an immunity passports, um, health certificates type program, um, really are um, protections that we need to be thinking about quite broadly um, as we think about digital ID and other analogous um, programs. And so when we think about how we design these programs to protect civil liberties, um, you know, broadly, I think there are two sort of buckets of concerns. Um, you know, there are somewhat technical concerns relating to privacy and security, um, you know, issues of sensitive data and how that is managed well. Um, and they're quite non-technical concerns relating to inclusion and, and equity. Um, and you know, I think that the principles that Laura has outlined and a lot of the underlying work that um, you know, technology companies around the world have done around sort of decentralized and, and interoperable technology, best practices around privacy, security, et cetera, make it possible to you know, envision um, a system where that individual data remains private, secure, where the data remains you know, in the hands of the individual. Um, and so, you know, we've we've thought a lot about sort of privacy, interoperability, decentralization, et cetera, as the technical elements necessary um, to achieve these ends. These non-technical questions, though, are much much harder. Um, Vilas touched on some of these, but you know, some of the the key concerns we've been thinking about is you know is equitable access. Um, you know, if you give someone a digital certificate that gives them the ability to return to work, to return to their public life. That's a tremendously valuable asset. Um, it's something that you can imagine people, you know, very desperately wanting to have. Um, and therefore, if we have inequities in terms of access to testing, we have inequities in terms of, you know, opportunity and the ability to return to your your day to day. Um, and so, you know, one of the foundational things that we've been discussing is the necessity of accessible, convenient, low cost, or free testing in any situation where. Um, an immunity certificate program is being is being considered. Um, also worrying is the potential that, you know, especially for those who are maybe struggling to make ends meet, um, you know, such a system might incentivize someone to to roll the dice and risk infection. Um, you'd sort of say it might be better for me to get this over with um, and be able to prove that I'm immune. Um, and so that's you know that is one of the reasons why we really stress that we want. You know, recent negative test result to carry the same amount of um, you know, sort of value as as immunity might, um, and of course, you know, privileges that immunity confer also create um, an environment ripe for counterfeiting and fraud. And so, a lot you know thinking needs to go into ensuring um, that there are very careful protections around around some of these um, issues. And you know, to so sort of the second point of how do you actually then see these. Um, principles being enshrined um, in people's work. Um, I, I, you know, I'll go back quickly to this ID, ID2020 certification, um, where you know, we've been thinking a lot about how quickly health authorities, governments, even businesses are rolling out some of these programs. Um, you know, anecdotally, I've heard that the, um, you know, the government of British Columbia has 400 different proposals on their desk for, for tech-based solutions um, related to COVID. Um, and they're trying to, you know, discern which of these makes sense to move forward, which of them truly have the protections for privacy in place, and do that while managing the immediate pandemic response. And so, when we think about, you know, in this period, you know, this sort of period of lightning quick adoption, um, trying to ensure that we have mechanisms that are cross jurisdictional, um, you know, that are market based approaches um, that you know, really do incentivize the development of technology that meets these principles and simultaneously makes it much easier for those who are um, adopting this technology to, to do so in an informed manner. Thanks, uh, Dakota. I mean, uh, again, a question for you, for you, Vilas, if I can, just building on what Dakota was just saying. Um, how confident are you 
that the ecosystem of support that you spoke about can be can be built uh, in the context of um, you know in a way in which inclusion and equity equitable access can be uh, uh, assured. I mean, the one thing we have seen during this period is that um, the pandemic is um, uh, is um, is accentuating some of the inequalities in society. Uh, inequalities in terms of access to health, access to education. Um, it's going to take strong purposeful leadership from, from governments to achieve that kind of inclusive uh, and, and, and uh, effective implement, implementation in the way that Dakota was describing. How, uh, how, how confident are you that this is possible? Well, I'll start with the bright spots. Um, I think we have seen a really uh, an entire societal shift in people's willingness both to learn about and to begin to take positions on these questions of technology as it affects our daily lives. And I think if you broaden that a little bit further, even from technology to highlight what is probably one of the most incredible public health and behavioral transformations that has happened in, in the last sort of hundred years, which is this idea of social distancing and mask wearing. Right? Four months ago, I think if we had asked populations, kind of what do you think of this outside of some notable sort of places on the globe, this was not even a question. And three or four months later, we now have this sort of built into daily life. So if we take that as an example of how these kinds of messages and communications can go and have an impact, then there's no reason why we can't also hope that the idea of sort of technological innovations that protect privacy can't have the same kind of widespread, immediate ecosystem-based approach. Now, if that's the bright spot, there are obviously some significant concerns and we need to take a step back. The first is you mentioned the need for strong leadership from governments. And I have to say that while we have seen a really sort of a quick response across a number of domains, questions about technology, privacy, and civil liberties have not been as prominent as some of the other responses that we've seen. And I say that, and I know it's a deep understatement. Um, there are some problems there. The first is, do we have the level of technical competence necessary in policy making institutions and bodies that let us even have this question in this conversation. I think the answer is we have for a long time seen that policy institutions are beginning to say these are questions we should consider and now they are deciding that they must be answered quickly. What that means though is that we need to have a robust conversation that actually brings other people to the table than industry actors and policymakers who are listening to them to write regulation. And for that reason alone, I'm so happy for the, the participants of this call and the conversation we're having. The second is uh, I'm worried about things like tech backlash. The idea that if we drive towards a quick and fast implementation that serves a first order set of needs, but creates second order harms and vulnerabilities, that it could lead to a situation where we lose trust in the idea that technological implementations can lead to positive social good. And I think we need to control for that in a couple of ways. One is we need to be quite transparent in how these things are being built to ensure that when those conversations are happening about identifying vulnerabilities or harms, those are brought not just to the front of the conversation in terms of those who are making decisions, but to the public that looks in and sees what's happening. I think the second is looking outside of the usual ecosystem, right? And again, so much of this work, because it's technologically complex, gets done inside of technological institutions. But there is a long history in this country and around the world of institutions that are built around questions of privacy, of personal civil liberty. And we need to figure out a way to have that conversation evolve in a way that those groups are talking to each other and co-creating. Again, I think the entities on this call that are represented here are doing a good job of this. I'm not sure if I would make the same claim about the broader conversation. And the third is there are conversations that are worth happening that I simply don't see being present. And they're around questions of data and a public good. What does it mean if we are going to go down this path of beginning to create technological silos of data that will be used by certain entities in their relation to others to talk also about common ownership and to think about the rights, responsibilities and privileges of citizens, of governments, of industry and employers and of the civil society. And I think we need to have that happen quickly. So Brad, you asked me my level of confidence and I think my level of confidence is high, but Confidence comes with the idea that we're also creating processes and structures that promote the kinds of principles we're talking about. I think we need to start from that conversation in order to get to the good outcome. And when we move from uh, the locations where the, around the world where this is a hot topic and, and the, um, the experience and expertise is there to em emerging nations, um, to uh, developing parts of the world, 
What are the additional complications and challenges we're going to face, do you think? Uh, uh, this is open to, to, to all of you, really, because I, it strikes me that so far we've been wrestling with these issues um, principally in the there in the US and in, in, in Europe where the, there is a real drive to, to implement um, uh, you know, track and trace systems uh, rapidly. Um, but you know, one wonders where the infrastructure is a lot poorer and where the quality of, uh, uh, or just availability access to information and, um, and, and guidance may be, may, may, be, uh, may be poorer. We're dealing with a different order of magnitude in terms of some of these challenges, aren't we? Yeah, I might just jump into, you know, I accept, I accept the question, but I might question the premise a little bit. And by that, all I mean is where we begin from a space of the U.S. and the EU leading on these topics, I actually believe that emerging nations and emerging environments have really shown their capacity to become digital natives quickly and to actually demonstrate leadership on these topics in meaningful ways over the last handful of years. Mm -hmm. So I think there are fundamental questions about societal approaches to questions of privacy and civil liberties. But I'm not sure that I think the challenges or the magnitude or the level of aptitude are different across those environments. I might stop there. I think my co-panelists probably have some specific thoughts too. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I mean, first, I um, completely agree with Vilas's point. I think that what we've seen and must, you know, historically much of ID2020's work has focused on digital ID in the context of developing countries is a real aptitude um, and, you know, in some cases, sort of the ability to leapfrog, um, where places have said, we're just not, you know, we're not bought in, we're not caught up in some historical way of working. Um, and in particularly in sort of lots of complex siloed di digital infrastructure that then has to be sort of retrofitted. Um, and so, you know, I think in many places, um, you know, just a willingness to sort of say, we're starting relatively fresh and therefore how do we design correctly um, from the outset? Um, I think one thing that I, you know, in the context of COVID that is important to mention is that you know, actually some of these, you know, some of these pieces around digital infrastructure, we need to ensure that the solutions we're implementing, you know, work in places with low connectivity, um, you know, that they work in settings where somebody does not have a smartphone. There are really important sort of equity and access issues um, that need to be considered. Um, you know, even here in the U.S., when we think about solutions that are smartphone dependent, you know, only 82% of the U.S. population has a smartphone. Um, and when we look around the world, of course, you know, that, that percentage um, skews much higher towards those who don't. Um, and so I think that just stresses sort of broadly um, that we need to be thinking about the solutions from the perspective of inclusion um, and, and, and access. Um, where I think there are some very significant concerns in the COVID response you know, frankly, the things that we think of as incredibly foundational, hand washing and, um, you know, social distancing and, you know, sort of basic hygiene practices. Um, you know, it's incredibly difficult to social distance if you have no place else you can go. Um, and, you know, if you don't have clean running water um, and access to soap and sanitation, um, you know, effective hand washing is impossible. And so I actually think in some cases, um, many of these technical tools may be more directly and easily implemented um, sort of across emerging markets than some of the practices um, you know, that have been sort of readily adopted here. Laura, would you add anything to this from, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think Dakota and Vilas both made great points. I think they're just, you know, I come at it from the perspective of, you know, the technology industry. And I think that one of the things that is important for us to communicate is that no matter what sort of technological solutions we come up with, those are not adequate, right? Like those, those can't solve the problem. They're not a silver bullet. There are a lot of people who just don't have access to, you know, the newest smartphone that really provides the type of functionality that you would need for proximity contact tracing or have access to a smartphone at all. Um, as Dakota mentioned, you know, not everyone in the U.S. population has it. And then of the of those who don't have smartphones we often find that it's members of the most vulnerable population so manual contact tracing needs to continue to be important and you know the other social distancing measures all of that is it's it's part of the entire solution tech can't solve the problem um, as much as we might want it to the um, it's reassuring actually to hear that in terms of aptitude and in and in some cases uh that 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 lack of a silo digital infrastructure that in terms of application, there may be scope to achieve 
as much, if not more, in, uh, in emerging economies. Uh, cl clearly, that helps to 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 rebalance some of those inequities that we've been talking about and and that and, and th th that are very real. Um, I, I I guess one one what one thought sp springs to mind as we as we move forward with the application of whatever system or approach is being looked at in terms of tracking or tracing or um, sort of digital certification. Um, we seem to hit blocks in the road, bumps a lot along the way. I, I noticed just today that the outsourcing group in the UK that's been helping uh, with the, you know, this, the, these developments um, leaked 300 email addresses for their, for their contract tracers. We seem to be bouncing in and out of uh, moments of confidence and then, um, and then these sorts of, of, of challenges. Um, I, I wonder whether you anticipate there being further or potentially greater implications or consequences of us failing as, as we try to implement. I just noticed how the markets uh, reacted with, uh, to more, with more skepticism about uh, a vaccine coming on stream uh, very soon. Uh, if we don't see effective systems put in place sooner rather than later that deal with the, some of these fundamental principles that you, you were talking about, there are additional consequences potentially. And I wonder if you just talk a little bit about that. And I open that up to, to, to anybody actually. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, it, yes, I, I think that's a, a great question and really a great point that underlies it, that uh, we are going to struggle as we work to develop solutions. I think, um, you know, as I mentioned, a technological solution can't solve it all, but I think there are also challenges in that we don't fully understand from a health perspective exactly how how we're going to move forward, right? That, that the, there are still a lot of questions around the disease itself. Um, and without understanding all of that, it's difficult to have a solution that can address all aspects of the disease. So I think, you know, we're going to do our best to move forward with the information that we currently have, but we're going to better understand different things and understand what the next year looks like as we as we sort of move forward into that, right? We have thoughts on when we'd like to see a vaccine developed, but until that's developed, we just don't know how, um, what that's gonna look like or what the actual timeline for that is. Right. Um, we have a question, um, actually. Oh, sorry, Vilas, go ahead. I might just quickly add, and I, I, I understand that, you know, we are talking about something very specific, but I think across the long arc of history, I think it is so important to acknowledge that these questions we are struggling with and will struggle with around the response to COVID-19 will in many ways be the definitional issues around kind of human experience in a digital age. And we are being forced to consider them in a very expedited timeline. And I think the answers we come up with here are really gonna give us a path forward. There's a message of hope that's deeply imbued in that, right? We have to get this right, but if we do, then we kind of change the way that people can interact with society, with technology, and with personal rights over a very long time frame. I'd, I'd echo that quickly, actually, um, which is just that I think that there's an important kind of mindset shift that we're seeing, um, where you know often systems have been designed for a single use case, for a single context, maybe for a single institution, um, and that has you know created some of these siloed, um, you know, sort of the siloed digital infrastructure that I was mentioning. Um, and it has limitations, you know, creates practical limitations on scale and on adoption. Um, and so I think one of the things that I've been, you know, sort of tracking and quite optimistic about is that I see in this case, um, people playing a really, you know, finding a lot of nuance in ensuring that there's, you know, a shelf life to the data perhaps that's being collected in the context of COVID-19, but that people are thinking about the technical solutions as things that may be you know, we'll have a life long afterwards um, and ensuring that, you know, it's extensible, interoperable technology that is being considered. Um, and so I do think that that really does provide the foundation for which we can have, you know, really interoperable, very well-intentioned technology um, you know, quite quickly adopted. Um, and so, you know, there is certainly tremendous risk in, in how quickly this is accelerating. Um, but when we think about how you kind of lay di digital infrastructure, um, you know, I think it does provide sort of the, the foundation from which we can build something um, with long potential. Great, great. 
We have a question from Alex Tai, actually. Uh, uh, Alex asks, which companies are the closest to providing a digital health identity product that you believe are worth analyzing? I guess who's, who's furthest down the track and, um, and coming forward with a solution, I guess, that is, uh, you believe is um, you know, amongst the strongest? Anybody want to venture on that one? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, what I'll share quickly is that we've had a number of companies who've come to us um, for certification in the last couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, after putting out that paper, um, you know, there's, it's galvanized, I think, a tremendous amount of interest from uh, technology companies who've been rushing to develop solutions. And I think really exciting to see that so many of them, um, you know, are working to adhere to the values that our uh, certification requirements outline. Um, and that they recognize that this is an important way of kind of signaling that. So, um, you know, without kind of going into specific uh, companies, I can say we've had a, a deluge of, um, of applicants recently. And what's exciting is just how quickly, um, yeah, the, the sort of feedback loop is just incredibly rapid. And so, you know, the flip side of that is hearing from businesses. Um, you know, we've been working with a handful of companies as well as um, in discussions with a handful of jurisdictions. Um, all of whom are saying, you know, we're thinking about rolling one of these out. Partially, how could we leverage certification to identify which of these solutions um, we should be adopting? Um, but also saying, what are the, you know, what is sort of the series of questions that we need to consider um, around some of these non-technical um, elements? And um, so I think there's, you know, there's a set of companies who are doing really, really good work, and we're seeing, you know, the governments, the health authorities, the businesses, et cetera, thinking about implementing these programs you know, sort of asking the right questions in terms of how we go about doing this well. Do you think, Dakota, that there are any places, any countries w that represent a good example of the aptitude and potential? Let's assume there's a, there's a, a solution, a technical solution provided or corporate solution provided, but the, a location where the leadership are getting it right or thinking about a move that could leapfrog. Sure. So a few very diverse examples. Um, you know, one area that we have been working with um, and that we've been sort of incredibly impressed with the, the process that they've gone through um, is British Columbia um, in Canada. Um, they have you know, been thinking about digital ID um, for, you know, for, for years. Um, this isn't something that they're sort of only thinking about in the context of COVID-19 and have done extensive work around the implementation of trust frameworks, um, enabling legislation, et cetera, to ensure that you know, they've, they have the, um, the necessary legal protections around a, you know, a digital ID program. Um, you know, what that has permitted is, you know, a, a model where somebody can, you know, go through an identity proofing process um, and now very quickly uh, get a, you know, a COVID health status certificate. And so they've been working on how they would roll that out for essential workers in, in British Columbia. Um, so that's a place where they're coming from a relatively, um, deep body of knowledge and a lot of, um, of long-term work. Um, you know, another place that we've been working quite closely and where you know, perhaps this leapfrogging potential um, is, is particularly sort of clear, um, we've been working, and, and Vilas um, knows about this project, but with the government of Bangladesh. Um, and this is, you know, over the last couple of years, thinking about um, digital ID and, and the intersection of digital ID with immunization. Um, so this, you know, this wasn't in the context of COVID-19 at the outset. Um, you know, Bangladesh is a country that has relatively low birth registration rates. Only 20% of Bangladeshi kids are receiving a birth certificate by their fifth birthday, um, with you know, profound implications then for their ability to you know, navigate, um, navigate life, enroll in school, et cetera. Um, but what is quite interesting is that Bangladesh's immunization system is incredibly well functioning. Um, so 97% of children um, are receiving not only the first dose of their vaccine, but you know, the second or third. Um, and so what we have been focusing on was, you know, how can we leverage um, this well-functioning system of community health workers um, as an entry point for digital ID? And so providing children with a verifiable digital credential of their immunizations, um, and that forming a basis from which they could then um, you know, have a digital ID useful in other contexts as well. Of course, in the context of COVID-19, um, you know, we're suddenly thinking a lot about vaccination, um, you know, potentially for you know, sort of 7 billion people. Um, and proof of that vaccination is going to be incredibly important. Um, and so in this setting, you know, suddenly there's a question of how can we 
um, perhaps accelerate this project um, to ensure that we have you know, proof of vaccination um, for, you know, for everyone in Bangladesh and you know, potentially for everyone in the world. Fantastic, that's a great example, thank you. Um, well, I think we're drawing towards the end of the session and I, I just wanted to ask each of you in turn, if you wouldn't mind, just to share any closing remarks, just really the, the defining kind of thought or uh, that you would want to leave this audience with in terms of um, what we can learn from this moment and how significant it, it is in terms of um, framing the context for all our sort of digital futures. Um, I, I think it's been intriguing to hear you all in different ways talk about this being about far more than health outcomes. This is really about you know, creating a context to, for, for, our, you know, for how we're going to operate going forward in a much broader context. So rights issues and broad privacy laws are clearly very relevant. Um, I, I wonder, Laura, what would your, you know, your closing thought be that, that, that we should all bear in mind? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think for me, something I've been heartened to see is how much people have been thinking about privacy and how we're responding to this pandemic. Um, you know, I think privacy has become increasingly top of mind for a lot of people. And it is, you know, we think of it as an essential human right, as something that's very important to uh, maintain the protection of that. And even in this pandemic time, when people do talk about the potential trade-off between privacy and public health, um, I think people have um, kept in mind the importance of preserving privacy and, um, you know, sort of abiding by these principles that we, we release, but we've seen a lot of uh, other groups releasing similar principles and sort of sharing some of these views that there are, um, there's growing consensus on what privacy looks like and, and what those sort of uh, important principles are. And people have really been keeping those in mind as we've been thinking through solutions. And, and that's uh, been great to see. And I think that that's going to be a trend that continues forward as we think about how to develop solutions to this. And um, I think it's also going to be something that we think about as we figure out how to how to address other larger, large societal problems, right? That there is the potential to use data for good, but that uh, requires an environment of trust and that trust is enabled by really ensuring that people's privacy is protected. Great. Vilas, any thoughts from you? Sure, I'll, I'll echo and pick up on that. I mean, I, I have to say it's sort of a, a personal passion and for the institution I'm representing has always been about democratization of technology. Um, what that has often meant though, is that we are trying to protect from harms and create the best possible use in a field that's dominated by the Goliaths, the large technology companies and the institutions. I think the opportunity that's presented inside of the tragedy that is COVID is for us to say that these issues actually don't require the multi-billion dollar tech company approach. They often can be done kind of at an individual level of innovation um, of institutions that sit outside of the traditional tech world. I think the, the key lesson that I take away from this is it's a time for really popular, broad-based civic participation on questions that will affect every single person on the planet. And it's not a conversation we can cede control or participation to a few institutions. We need to take ownership and responsibility. I think as we think about privacy in the context of COVID, as we think about immunity credentials, as we think about policy responses, every single voice has to be both educated and vocal in advocating for their interests. I think if we can nail that, then I think suddenly we have a new pathway for how we deal with the 21st century. Great, thank you. And then Dakota, any last thoughts? Um, um, I mean, first, just wanted to you know, to thank Vilas and McGovern, and by extension, other you know other foundations for for leadership on that, because I think um, you know so much of the investment that we've seen has gone into the development of vaccines, has gone into the development of vitally important elements of this response. Um, but so important to a response that people feel, um, you know, where there is participatory, democratized, where there's, you know, an ecosystem of trust requires investments um, in things that are sort of less technical in nature. Um, and so I, you know, I think it's just really um, valuable and such an important role for philanthropy to play and civil society to play to ensure that there's, you know, diversity of opinions and diversity of views. Um, brought into the conversations about how we respond. Um, I think one, you know, perhaps just closing thought, and you know, perhaps this um, follows quite nicely on both what Laura and Vilas have said, is that I think you know this is fundamentally about trust. Um, 
you know, that we are all trying to navigate our way out of a situation that has been frightening um, and you know, has caused tremendous strain on our businesses, on you know, our personal lives. And you know, to do that in a way that feels good, we need to trust our leaders, we need to trust the institutions, we need to trust the technology. Um, and frankly, right now, time, you know, this is a period where trust is often lacking. Um, you know, that we, we have not seen um, you know, sort of, I think, a response from, from many of many sectors um, that people feel really confident in. But I think where there has been a lot of trust generated is really in sort of multi-stakeholder dialogue, um, in, you know, transparency and ensuring that, you know, different organizations are brought together, that institutions are developed, that there's sort of clear processes. Um, and so that they, you know, the decisions being taken um, the route forward is one that people feel like they have been able to watch, they've been able to provide input to, um, that they understand that the perspectives being brought to the table um, reflect kind of a, a strong diversity of opinions. And so it's just been very exciting um, from our vantage point, certainly as a multi-stakeholder alliance, um, but to see so much of this sustained um, sort of cross-sectoral um, collaboration and, and, and sort of the you know, almost mechanisms to do that um, developing that I think will be sustained long after the um, long after COVID. Well, I'd just like to thank all three of you on behalf of everybody um, who's participated and um, and been attending throughout this session. I, it's been quite inspiring, uh, frankly, in a in a time when we've seen very little collaboration and cooperation between nation states and at a multilateral level. You know. WHO and other UN organizations, as well as the EU and, um, and, and nations across the globe struggling to collaborate, taking very much a, a, an individualistic approach to dealing with this issue. That multi-stakeholder dialogue and the, um, the leadership that you're bringing and others to this is, um, is, uh, is reassuring, because clearly this goes way beyond the moment and way beyond the health issues we're dealing with. So. On behalf of everybody, I'd just like to thank all three of you for your for your time and for um, for, for for all your uh, all your hard work. Um, thanks so much for.